so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this podcast on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. In prime position on the main drag in the Blue Mountains town of Katoomba sits a cafe. The big yellow banner across the top of the building highlights its name, the Yellow Deli, with a smattering of tables and chairs out the front, providing the perfect perch to enjoy the morning sun. Inside, it's like you've walked into another world, a cross between Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings and an old-fashioned fairy tale with antique lampshades, cosy fireplaces and furniture made out of big chunks of wood. The menu is a delightful mix of sandwiches, soups, salads and smoothies and the reviews are glowing. Love the decor, food was wonderful, writes one reviewer on Google. The food came quickly and was mouth-wateringly delicious, says another. But all is not as it seems and a quick glance up at the waiters and waitresses serving you in their old-fashioned conservative outfits is the first clue. You see, this cafe is run by a global cult known as the Twelve Tribes, a community masked in secrecy and disturbing allegations. While sugar and coffee might be on the menu, those serving it are banned from tasting it. At their home at nearby Balmoral House or Peppercorn Creek Farm, their lives are dictated by a strict set of rules and regulations, many of which have been the subject of multiple police investigations over the decades. We have breaking news following our investigation into the 12 Tribes Church. Today, the secretive cult that's been the subject of accusations of child exploitation and medical neglect was raided by police. But most don't find out about the dark underbelly that exists within this community until they've already been sucked in. They simply sit down for a roast beef sandwich on a casual Wednesday morning, hoping to finish their book in the sun, only to be befriended by a friendly staff member inviting them over for dinner. I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with award-winning journalist Tim Elliott, who's been investigating the 12 Tribes, a Christian fundamentalist sect with communities all around the world for over a decade. This year, He's taken his findings and created a nine-part podcast called Inside the Tribe. He joins me today to discuss what he's learned about the group. And just before we get into my chat with Tim, please be aware that this conversation does contain discussions of child abuse and coercive control. If these things are triggering for you, feel free to give this one a miss. We'll have another episode next week, or you can search through our back catalogue of episodes for another case that's of interest to you. Tim, I want to start with Eugene Spriggs. Tell me about him. Okay, Eugene Spriggs. Really interesting character. Tall, good-looking, super charismatic American guy born in Chattanooga, Tennessee. He grew up in the 60s and, you know, that was a tumultuous time, Vietnam, Charles Manson, sit-ins, all sorts of stuff, right? But even by the standards of those days, this guy's life was super eventful, super tumultuous. By the time he was age of 30, he had been in the army, he'd been a carnival barker, he'd managed a carpet factory, he'd been married and divorced three times. And by his 31 or 32, he'd basically had a nervous breakdown. And so the tribes were born? Is that where and this comes Essentially, in? the tribes were born when he was walking down a beach in California, Santa Barbara, I think it was, and he heard God talk to him and say, I want you to form another church, a new church, and that's how it all got going. 
So he was already a, a religious man? Yeah, he was already religious. He was also a bit of a grifter, you know, like he'd ripped people off when he was growing up in Chattanooga. He was a bit of a wastrel, you know, partying, drinking, drugs, football player. So he was a bit of a all-round kind of party boy. But, yeah, he saw the future and he thought, okay, I'm going to start a church for young people. And he wanted to be a bit different, a bit cool. So he started a church where you just basically sat around in a house. He got a house given to him, actually, by a friendly dentist in Chattanooga. Yeah, I know, it's a bizarre story. And they sat around and they met together, young people, and did rap nights and and read the scripture, learning about Jesus. It sounds like what it started as is quite different to what it turned into if they were doing yeah. rap in the early days. Yeah, it started very much as a – he wanted it to be very youth-focused. He was kind of informed by the Jesus freaks and hippies in those days, so it was very energetic, very spontaneous. But it morphed as time went on into a more fundamental Christian sect with some pretty heavy doctrine going on. And as time went by, Eugene Spriggs became more and more the supreme leader in a really scary way. When it kind of did morph into something a little bit more strange, what was the overarching vision that he had at that point for the tribes? Well, it's weird because the church itself is a blend between Judaism and Christianity. What they wanted to do essentially is that Spriggs, who called himself Yonek by now, he gave himself a Hebrew name. In fact, when you join the tribes, you must get a new name, you get new clothes, a new identity. You disappear for all intents and purposes. So he gave himself the Hebrew name Yonek, which means Sprig. So he wanted to get rid of established religion, get established religion out of the way. The Roman Catholic Church, Protestantism, get it out of the way and take Christianity back to the first century after Christ when there was a whole sort of small band of disciples wandering around the desert, basically preaching to each other and learning about God. So he wanted to take the established religion out of it. So he got everybody to pair it right back. But it got funky in that he read Revelations, the book of Revelations, in a very particular way. Book of Revelations is a really spooky kind of book all about Armageddon and the end of the world. And he came to believe that it was the 12 tribes' mission to raise 144,000 pure male children who would then go out and bring on the end of the world by fighting Satan during Armageddon, right? So basically that kind of twisted the whole group because – they saw child raising as really important. Child raising became super, super central to the whole sect in that you had to raise a, a little cohort or big cohort, 144,000 little boy warriors. And to do that then you had to make them super obedient and super responsive to adults' commands. So in the 12 tribes it got really nasty and really ugly and it still is, in that if you're a child and you're raised in the 12 tribes and you don't do what you were told by an adult, you will get beaten, severely beaten with a stick. And when I say beaten, we've come across stories in the podcast of, you know, two-year-olds being beaten for eight hours for not eating their food. Two-year-old. A two-year-old. An eight-month-old, when they kicked the woman who we base her amazing story is the backbone of our podcast, her baby kicked at one stage. And it was eight months old, so she was trying to change its nappy. And one of the sisters, one of the guiding sisters, which is all very sort of handmaid's tale, but yeah. said, you must, you know, this baby's kicking you. You must spank it with a stick and gave her a stick and she was forced to spank. And this discipline isn't just for the little boy warriors. It's for the girls too. Yeah, it's for both. Children in general, you have to respond to adults' commands all the time. And it doesn't have to be your parent. It can be any adult that you come into contact with in the community. They all have the right to tell you what to do and they all have the right to hit you. And it's all for this vision of creating a warrior tribe of children. Yeah. The thing is that it's very old-fashioned. It's incredibly mm. old-fashioned. So Spriggs basically is reading the Bible literally. Yeah. Because he's the chosen one and he's the direct pipeline to God. Yeah. How big of a following did he manage to amass? 
like it's not big. It's only like three, four thousand people worldwide, right? But it's got this really interesting network of communities in all over the world. Like it's amazing, you know, Australia, Germany, Argentina, Brazil, England, Spain, everywhere you go, almost you will find a little community, and they're all sort of self-sustaining, and they're all super high control, mind control, physical control, the whole lot, economic control. And they all follow the same kind of set of rules. Yeah, they all follow the same rules. It's the 12 tribes. For example, that child training that I told you about, there's a manual, 287-page manual, child training manual, right, that they give all parents. They print it out on their commune and they give it to all the parents. And when you raise your child, you have to refer. And the woman who we, Rose, whose story we followed, she held on to that book like, read it every night and, you know, even though she's out now, it's like, what was I thinking? Apart from the discipline, what else was it telling parents to do with their kids? Oh, the kids thing is really, is that the whole idea is that you do what you're told and they're subject to you, as is your wife, any women. Women are subject to their men all the time. So it's a very patriarchal society. Oh, it's a heavily patriarchal society. It's like women do what they're told. Yeah. The men are the head of the household. All the elders are men. And women are seen as pretty much property. I want to focus a bit more on the Australian arm Mm. of this tribe. When did it actually make its way into Australia and where is it in Australia? There's a small community in Picton, which is on the outskirts of Sydney. And they own a lovely farm there called Peppercorn Creek Farm. I've been there. We tried to interview them and they turned us down. But the farm is lovely. It's got a little creek running through it. So they own that and they all live on there. There's about 60 people on there now. It used to be 140 and I think the times have got to them. The community out there now is only about 60 or 70. But the weird thing is that they run an incredible network of businesses worldwide, everything from you know restoration companies, construction companies, a farm in Brazil, yeah, cafes, restaurants, all sorts of stuff. They're a money-making machine. Well, for those that have visited... Katoomba in Blue Mountains, Yeah, they might have come across one of their cafes. Yes, indeed. The Yellow Deli. And their food is lovely. Like their food, <laughs> everybody says their food is I've amazing. I've heard it's one of the best cafes in town. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. A little bit creepy. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a little bit culty, not surprisingly. And look, the food there is one of the main ways they recruit new members, always has been. So they, they grow all their food on the farm. It's all beautiful, fresh, organic, hand-grown stuff. They make it in these cafes and restaurants, and it's truly unbelievable. It's It really wins people over. At work the other day, I was talking about it at the Sydney Morning Herald, and this woman said to me, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that place. It's amazing. The food in there is incredible. And then she said, but the kids look a little weird, <laughs> <laughs> which is one thing that always strikes people, and they're always like, yeah, they've got a funny – Got a funny look about them, don't they? Energy. Funny energy about them. But yes, no, the food is lovely. But the thing about the food is that the people within the cult here and overseas don't eat particularly well at all, especially overseas from what I've heard from all the people we talk to. They eat terribly. Like they eat, you know, buckets of slimy carrots and maybe, you know, one chicken between 30 people, that sort of thing. Well, I was going to say, isn't some of the rules that they can't have things like sugar or... Yeah. Chocolate or and yet they're making all of this beautiful produce. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well and the re- it. Yes. It's because the cafes are the public facing side of the tribes. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the bit that everybody sees. And so it's really important for them to have a, a nice, attractive, glowy, warm and fuzzy shop front, in essence, right? And that's the cafes and restaurants. But everything they do is put into that. The food they actually eat themselves, the members are treated like really poorly. So the members get all the crap food and all the really good stuff is given to the public, so it looks great. Obviously, they're making money through these shop fronts, but is any of that money actually going to the individuals, the members that are- No. No. No, not a cent goes to the individuals. Not a cent. See, the workers don't see a cent. And it's because they're not classed as workers. They're, the tribes themselves classify them as volunteers- so they don't earn a wage, so they don't pay tax. Is this legal? Uh, yeah, it's all legal. Yeah, Because I guess um, they're doing it. It's they're not against doing their will. It, apparently of their own free will. 
But as we learnt, you know, the persuasion, the power of persuasion, the way they rearrange the furniture in someone's head to make them think in a different way is just eerily and creepily brilliant. I mean, they're just master manipulators. So you could say these people volunteered, they willingly signed up, but you don't. You don't willingly sign up to join a cult. You don't one day wake up going, oh, yeah, I'm going to join a group that will manipulate me, beat my children, starve me and treat me like a slave. (laughs) You wake up going, you know what? This group looks like a beautiful utopia out in the bush. They're all farming together. They grow this beautiful food. They all work together. It's one big family, happy family. And then things turn as time goes on. The narrative gets really dark. I want to delve into some of those darker beliefs or the gateway to them because we touched on a few things that you're not allowed to do, but there's a very, very long list of things you are not allowed to do yeah. in the 12 tribes. Can you <laughs> give us a bit of an insight? Yeah. The thing is that all these rules change as well. It's all really capricious and it's a way of controlling people, yeah. really. You know, you tell a bunch of people who are susceptible, you can't do that, you can't do this. No. You do this. You can't do that. It's a way of keeping them in control. It's meant to isolate people from the outside world so you can't read books that are not prescribed by the elders. You can't read magazines, newspapers, listen to the radio, watch TV, play games, eat lollies. The kids are prohibited from doing anything like that. You're not allowed to use contraception, much like the Catholic Church, I guess. But yes, there's a long list of all sorts of stuff that really keep people under the heel. What about things like medical access, schooling? Yeah. Well, they're homeschool. They don't use outside schools because they consider them too worldly, too corrupted by the modern world. So they print all their homeschooling material on site. The women teach. Women do all the cooking, cleaning, of home course, caring, teaching. Yeah, it's, it's just typical. So the women teach these texts that are vetted by the 12 tribes. They don't vote either. The whole thing, they don't go to hospital because, well, there's several reasons for that, I think. One of them is that because it's part of the outside world, but more importantly, I think it's because, you know, you go to the hospital with someone who, say, has a really easily preventable disease or condition, and you're going to get noticed, and then you rock up in strange clothing, which is the clothing they wear, and people are going to notice, and they're going to go, oh, hold on you guys from 12 tribes, you know, and then you get attention. They don't want that. With a lot of this, and I feel like I'm going to ask you this question a lot, is that legal? (laughs) I mean, you don't have to go to hospital if you're unwell. No, you don't have to go. It's up to you. So, you know, you don't go if you don't want to go. But that's what makes a lot of this so hard. It's really hard to understand. And people often go, oh, these stupid people, they should have known better. It's just, you know, they're morons. They should never have joined. They get what they deserve. But- It's hard to explain to people that when these people joined, their only crime was being idealistic. So they saw this amazing community that all worked together, like I was saying, this beautiful kind of utopia, and they thought, yeah, I want a bit of that. I want to opt out of capitalism. I want to opt out of, you know, the rat race. Their only crime was being idealistic and saying, okay, I can make this work in a different way. And then slowly they get manipulated. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Barth. I'm speaking with investigative journalist Tim Elliott about the 12 Tribes cult. You speak at length in the podcast to a couple called Mark and Rose who do just that. They had a normal life. Yeah. And then they get kind of recruited. How did that happen? How do they get enmeshed derailed this, yes, yeah how does their life get derailed yeah okay so this is another thing everybody everybody usually thinks i would never join a cult it's ridiculous like i was saying nobody joins a group they know to be evil right so mark and rose were at a kind of juncture in their life they'd just come back from europe and they were a little bit in between stools they, they were just trying to find their feet in sydney they had some kids They'd been working overseas, but they didn't have a job here and they were trying to find some work and they were trying to catch up with new friends or old friends that they had here, but the scene had moved on. And so they were a little bit vulnerable. And one day they were at a festival in Newtown 
and Mark started walking around. And he was approached by a woman with long hair, you know, flowing cotton dress, who said, looks like you need a home. And it probably did. You know, Mark was looking a bit lost. And that's how they get you. And he was like, oh, right. And she said, I hear, have this pamphlet about this group called the 12 Tribes. It's this lovely, beautiful community. We live in blah, blah, blah. I've heard people describe that initial recruitment process as love bombing. Yeah, love bombing, it's a big part of it. So what happens is Mark then, Mark and, and Rose and his kids, they went along for a weekend and you know, don't join straight away, you suss it out. So Mark, for a couple of weekends in a row, for a month or two, they went along every Friday night and just had dinner with the group out there, sussed it out, tried to see what they thought, get a feeling, get a vibe from it. And it was beautiful. They said it was just everybody was all over you. You're great. You're, oh, man, you look amazing. I can tell you've got, you know, incredible thoughts. You really, you're an empath, you know, you're a super empath. You're an amazing guy, you know. And look at your wife. You guys and beautiful kids. How do you, you know, all that sort of stuff. It's love bombing, yeah. It's like, you're great, man. You're unreal. We really want you here. You're really valued. We'd love to have you. So, again, it's... Vulnerable people and virtually anybody, really. I mean, <laughs> it feels good to be love bombed. And like you said, it's not like it happens overnight that those more troubling aspects pop up. No, it's-, it's you don't get introduced to that for a start. You can go along, you join, but you're not a inner member for quite a while. It can take like six months, a year before you become baptized. And then once you're baptized, you start to get a little bit more into the doctrine and they start to tell you a little bit more about the child raising, about the kooky theology. And by that time, you have often withdrawn yourself from outside society. So you've left your family behind. When you join up, you often give all your possessions to them. That's what they want you. That's kind of like, oh, now you've joined. Give us that car. Give us that superannuation money. Give us that. It's incredible. And people really want to belong. So they do. They give up their super. Yeah, people have done that. Yeah. Once again, is that legal? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can do what you want and give up their labor, give up their minds, you know, because they want to belong. They, people want to belong. That's why people join religions, for God's sake. And so by the time they start getting into the really strange, kooky doctrine, you've left your outside life behind. And so you don't really have a lot to go to anymore. By the time all of this became apparent to Mark and Rose, were they well and truly in it? Or were oh, they, yeah, did they, they question it? No, they, every, I think everybody questions it to an extent. And I want to point out here, make it really clear that there are some really lovely elements of life in all these communities around the world. Everybody we spoke to said at the beginning it was really beautiful. It delivered. It was a lovely community. Everybody looked after one another. It was really healthy. It felt safe. And... That's part of the appeal. It is good. People do make lasting friendships in there. It's like everything. It's good and bad. It just turns out that there's a lot of bad in this group. And I guess we only have had the chance to speak to the people that have come out the other side yeah, who yeah. do have bad things to say. There are people that still live there. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. still like that community and that sure. environment. Yeah. We went in there to talk to them about it because it's really important with it, any piece of journalism that you try and get the other side. That's your duty as a journalist. And so we put a whole long list of questions to headquarters in, in the States. We asked them about all sorts of stuff that we were going to air, every single part of what we were going to air, and said, do you have a response? And have your say. We'd really like to get you on the podcast. The co-producer, Camille Bianchi, actually went into one of the communities there, was freaked out. Got to say, she totally really? freaked out. Here we turned up to Picton on the farm and they were really lovely. Said, come in, you know, let's talk. As soon as you mention you're a journalist, they're very sus. Again, I can understand that because they've got some really unwelcome attention. So but- headquarters give you anything? No, you just don't hear back from them. Yeah, right. They don't interact in- because they just figure why this world's going to pass. All that matters is the next one and we don't care. Can you leave 12 tribes if you want to? Is that hard? It's really hard. Yeah, it's really hard because, like I was saying, when you join, you give up all your possessions, your money, clothes you had, your car. You pull away from all your friends and family. You give them up. You get a new name, a new Hebrew name. You abandon your worldly name. 
So Gemma becomes uh, Hamek mm. or something, or y- Yasida or some female Hebrew name. That's it. You become that person. As time goes by, you lose the ability to interact in the outside world. They don't allow you to handle money. You don't read the newspaper. You don't watch TV. You don't know what's going on. You don't have anything that other people have. You don't have a bank account. You don't have a phone account. You don't know how to operate a computer. So if you choose to suddenly leave, like what the hell are you going to be running to? You're going to be running from something that's horrible maybe and you're you're not loving it, but it's secure. You know what that is. If you leave, what are you going to? You don't know what you're entering into. Your life has to begin from scratch, totally from scratch. Some people describe, sort of described it to us as, you know, like a comet re-entering orbit at a million miles an hour with no guardrails. You got no idea. Where do you send your kids to school? You got to find a school. You got to learn how to rent a place. Never done that before. Well, haven't might have, mightn't have done it for twenty years. What happened to your job? How do you get a job? In the tribes, you might have been working in a cafe, or you might have been welding or something in one of their businesses. But try and figure it out. It's hard. It's really hard. Also, there's another really important factor, which is fear. Fear is a really important factor. So. From the get-go, they tell the kids in there who were born in there that the outside world is irredeemably evil and sick and full of people who are out to hurt you and get you. And if you leave, you're going to have a car crash maybe or you're going to become gay, which is one of the worst things imaginable for them. Right. Or you're, you're going to be damned forever in what they call the lake of fire, which is exactly what it sounds so when you put it that way, yeah, you can be really sick of the group and terrified and want to get out, but there are all these factors that are keeping you bound into that group. A lot of what we've spoken about is hard to comprehend, but it's not actually a crime because these people have yeah. chosen to be there and even though their minds have been rearranged, as you might say, they're there on their own free will. Mm. But I want to talk about some of the aspects that do actually delve into criminal. And we were talking earlier about the punishments that are given to children. Mm. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Because there have been some investigations into some of the communities, or many investigations. Yeah, around the world they've been investigated multiple times by police, by authorities, by child welfare, the FBI in the States, the German authorities, New South Wales police here. In Germany, for instance, you're not allowed to smack your kids in Germany. It became apparent a documentary maker went into one of the communities, the 12 tribes communities there, and they he filmed footage of them belting their kids. He gave it to the authorities and they raided the commune there. And kids were taken away. Here, there's all sorts of stuff that's happened, illegal stuff, burying of stillborn babies, illegal burials. Uh, not reporting deaths of babies, all sorts of stuff. So it's hard getting any word out of the police, though, here. They're like, oh, well, you know, inquiries, are, you know, the investigation's ongoing. We can't talk about it. So it's very hard to pin these people down. Especially because, as you say, there's been so many investigations and they all kind of seem to chip away it a little mm. bit but not really get very yeah, far. Yeah, no, my wife was listening to the podcast going, oh, my God, this is outrageous. These people can't get busted. Why doesn't someone bust them? And they do here and there around the world. Like the FBI have looked into the group repeatedly in the States and they've done some good. They've arrested some people who've been you know, sexual predators in the group and bits and pieces here and there. But how do you shut down a whole group? You, it's hard. When you've got a group like that, it has to implode from the inside and the, its own members have to go, you know what, this is just, this is not working. It's wrong and leave themselves. Well, there was one example of that kind of happening in Australia where in August 2020, one of the Australian founders died in a fire, a suspicious fire that Mm, someone was arrested for. Can you tell us about that? Oh, wow. This is one of the most amazing elements of our podcast. So the guy who died, it's just fascinating what the role this guy played, okay, in the whole (laughs) setup in Australia. He brought the 12 tribes to Australia in the mid-90s. So he was the guy From the States, here. an American guy. So he was the dude here. He was the head of it. He got really disillusioned and he left. And all I can say is that it didn't end very well for him. So he was allegedly murdered and his house was burnt down. 
is a bit of a recurring motif in the 12 tribes with people who leave the cult and then have, you know, mysteriously die. Really? Uh, die in car crashes or, yeah. Here in Australia? Yeah, overseas, all overseas, yeah, apart from, well, Han was here. He died here. And he'd spoken out against the tribes really vocally. And, yeah, things happen to people who leave. Has that been investigated? Uh, yes. I can't talk nearly as much as I would like to about yeah. that because it was an underage it was a minor who killed him, allegedly killed him. Emergency services were called here to Zanecki's property at about 5.45pm on Sunday the 16th of August. Following reports, it was a light. Crews from the Rural Fire Service took several hours to extinguish the blaze. Police investigations resulted in the arrest of a 17-year-old boy in nearby Kyogle a few days later. For legal reasons, we can't name the 17-year-old accused, but we can tell you he's been charged with murder, improperly interfering with a corpse and malicious damage by fire. He's been refused bail and he'll face court again at the end of October. Is there any other things that your investigation has uncovered that would surprise people? Any criminal activity that you were just perplexed by? Suspicious deaths, terrible abuse, sexual abuse, drug use and drug sourcing, all sorts of stuff. So in this community, there's a lot more sinister activity happening that perhaps people might not even realise. There's a lot of bad stuff going on, but I want to stress that there's black and white. You know, like I've said before, there's many elements to this group that are really lovely and that people found very rewarding and good until it turned really, really bad. We've spoken a lot about Mark and Rose, but have you spoken to any other ex-members? Do they have any interesting anecdotes to share? Oh, we spoke to about 40 or 50 ex-members around the world. French ones, Spanish ones, Brazilians, Americans, lots of Americans, Germans. Spoke to people all around the world about this group. They're and everywhere and they're, they're very well spread around the world. And yeah, we spoke to lots. And do they all share a common feeling about how poorly they were treated? If they've left, yes. I think they're very disillusioned and they feel hurt and ripped off and damaged. Uh, damaged people. And do their lives look normal now, now they're out? Oh, they do, some of them in the States are really battling to get their lives together. I mean, starting from scratch, like I said, they have to start from scratch. They have to find some way to support themselves. When they leave, one beautiful woman had to, and her kids had to walk out with, you know, in sandals and the clothes on her back. And her kids literally got picked up by a truck, taken to a hostel. That's how her new life began. She built it up from there. Then she got a job in a restaurant cooking, and then she moved up from there and got a place to rent. And yeah, they have to begin again. Because a lot of them leave family behind, don't they? Yeah. One guy we spoke to who was integral to Mark and Rose's story left his wife because he was leaving and said, I'm getting out of here now. Either you come or I'm taking the kids now. And she said, no, I believe in, the, in this group and I'll stay. See ya. Mm. So she stayed in the cult and her daughter and two sons left. And imagine the damage that would cause to you if you knew that your mother had chosen a fundamentalist Christian sect over you. And it's not like you can do shared custody, can you? You can't drop them off at the Oh no, they don't at the he community even, on the weekend. He doesn't even know where she is. Yeah. One set of kids that I heard of were taken to Kyoto because of they're in Japan as well. So people just lose track of people. They're given new identities. They're shuffled around the world. They disappear. I think we've like touched on the fact that this stuff doesn't happen overnight and for people that aren't in it, it's like how? How did you end up like this? But this isn't the only quote marks, cult in the world. There are cults everywhere. Yeah, There's these yeah. communities where people are indoctrinated into these set of beliefs. Has it given you a new kind of idea as to how that could happen? Like, could you, Tim, be a member of a cult if you were at the right circumstances in your life, you were vulnerable? Could we all end up in a cult? Yeah, you've hit the nail right on the head. And it's really a good question. It's vo about vulnerability. So everybody, you know, thinks that they're too smart to be in a cult that they've got the last too much together and that is completely false. At some stage in everybody's life, I believe they're vulnerable enough to join a group like this. At some stage, whether it's even just one moment where you're just you're just at that crux in your life where you're weak enough, you're vulnerable enough, you're searching for something hard enough, yeah, everybody is capable of 
becoming a victim in that way. That's a new fear unlocked for me because how do we uh, make sure we don't end up in a cult if we're at the Yellow Deli, you know, cafe eating a lovely avocado on toast <laughs> at a low point in our life? Keep eating and then walk out. Yeah, right. <laughs> Keep eating and leave. Yeah, I, I guess you just, look, people develop all sorts of destructive behaviours, I guess. This is just one of them. I mean, I guess you could become uh, alcoholic or you could develop all sorts of negative behaviours, joining and believing in a really destructive theology is just one of them, I guess. This group is still very much alive and well. Mm. I'm assuming they're still recruiting new members. They're oh, yeah, growing yeah. around the world. What are your concerns with that after everything that you've uncovered? What really upset me was the fact that they separate families. Okay, So a lot of people we talk to and we, whose stories we follow lost children and they haven't seen them again or they lost parents and they haven't seen them again. So that really motivated us. I thought, that's really sad. It's very moving when you hear that and people break down and cry and say, I haven't seen my mum in 30 years. They're still doing that. You know, they're still recruiting and all sorts of groups, not just 12 tribes, all sorts of groups. Scientology, all these groups that cause that kind of harm, break up families, they're still out there. And it's just worth highlighting that yeah, it's something to be aware of. And why can't we have, for instance, the coercive control laws that are coming in? Why can't we, instead of just having them focused on domestic partners, why can't we have that applied to groups like the 12 tribes, which are coercive? People say, oh, why are these stupid people for joining a cult? But would you say that to a woman who's being beaten up by her husband? Would you say, you deserve it? because you're in an abusive relationship, you'd never say that. No. They didn't marry a guy who they knew was going to beat them up. They married a guy who they thought they were in love with. It's exactly the same thing. Do you think that the police will eventually get in there? They've been trying for decades. How are we going to break this all up? How are we going to get some justice for these oh, people? I don't know. I mean, hopefully the podcast... The story of Mark and Rose, which is really the, the narrative through this podcast is so powerful and it, you just go, like I said, my wife was just like, what? How can't the cops, how can't the authorities do something? So maybe podcasts, maybe just shedding further light on these groups is one way to do it. Thanks to Tim for assisting us to tell this story. If you'd like to hear Tim's full investigation into the 12 tribes, including first-hand interviews with people who have left the community, you'll find his podcast Inside the Tribe linked in our show notes. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Gemma Bath, with audio design by Madeline Joannou. The executive producer is Gia Moylan. If you enjoyed this episode, let us know by leaving a rating or review in your favourite podcast app. It helps other true crime fans find our content and helps us keep making the episodes you get to enjoy every week. Thanks for listening. I'll be back next week with another true crime conversation. <laughs>